Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Make known his deeds among the people. Wherever you are in your own small way, why don't we just pause and give God a praise offering for God is indeed worthy to be praised. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Make known his deeds among the people. The old song said it is no secret what God can do. If it is a secret, it's because we didn't tell it. Amen. Amen. I, I would that wherever you are that you would stand with me as we as has become our custom as we're going through this time like no other in the lives that any of us has lived. 2020 is in our rearview mirror, but moving over into 2021, we are still dealing with the pandemic that has enveloped the world and certainly our nation that has mishandled the pandemic from a public policy standpoint more so than any other nation. And we pause uh, in silence to remember the 380,000 and counting Americans who have lost their lives to this novel coronavirus, to the more than 22 million Americans who have been infected, that we know that have been infected, for the hundreds of thousands of first respondents and doctors and nurses and hospital attendants who put their lives at risk every day in the service of the sick. The whole nation has been affected and certainly the whole world. They are gone but never to be forgotten. And also this morning we are mindful of the five human beings, perhaps maybe counting, but at least five, who lost their lives in the insurrection that unfolded in our nation's capital on this past Wednesday. We pause to honor their lives. Gone, but never ever to be forgotten. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. Help me say, God has. Yes, He has. Set me, me free. free. Mm -hmm. God, God has smiled on me. me. He's been good to, to me. me. Said again, God has. Oh, yes, He has. Set me free. I know, I know that God, God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. Let me tell you how God's been good to me recently. Georgia. <laughs> Georgia. In all the peace I've had, just an old sweet song, Georgia, on my mind, mm -hmm. Georgia, Georgia. Come so sweet and clear, so sweet and clear, like moonlight through the pine. 
Oh, that's why I say that God has smiled on me. He has set me free. Set me free. I know, I know. God has, God has smiled on me. He has, He's been good. He has, He's been good. Mighty, mighty good. He's been good. He's my lily of the valley. He's been good. Bright and morning star. He's been of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Would you bless us now, Lord, in this preaching moment for your glory. As you have done so many times before, as we stand in the tent door, awaiting the ascending, the descending of the cloud of glory. Envelop us, O oh God, subsume us and consume us in your will. Let us hide behind the cross and let your word go forth as a two-edged sword, cutting between the marrow and the bone, bringing hope to the hopeless, but convicting us of sin that hides in the slightest crevices of our hearts unconfessed. Lord, have thine own way once and again. You're still the potter and we're still but the impressionable clay to be shaped and molded. So deformed by this world, so needing to be reformed and until we conform to the image of your darling son and our savior. So right now, right here, let the reformation, the, the conforming continue. And we would be careful to give you alone the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the name of Christ, we do pray, and we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Stand with me all over wherever you are, those who are here and those out in the digisphere. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Um, the 30th chapter, and I want to read a singular verse. I am using my Bible app on my phone. I am not checking my email or Facebook. I'm reading from the New International Version, Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, the 19th verse, where it reads, This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. 
scripture as it is written. May the Lord have a blessing for the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, tilt back, lay back in the presence of God and whoever else is present, you may be again. I want to thank uh, Minister Spinks for leading us to the throne of grace this morning in prayer and providing a very enthusiastic welcome. Amen. And uh, I also want to thank this young, this youth ensemble and for the fab fabulous job that they have done. We're training them in the tradition of the stressful tradition of just follow the pastor. Amen. We don't know what he's going to do. we just going to follow him. Amen. And if we if he take a wrong turn, we're going to take it with him with zeal. Amen. I thank God for them, for their leadership, and Jane, who's doing such a great job uh, with them. And I would, amen. I would be remiss if I didn't thank God for this fabulous band, this posse. They're just smooth today. Just, just, just smooth. We thank God for all of them and for the best media services, I think, anywhere. Um, this is the only church I've ever been in where people look forward with anticipation to the announcements. Amen. Even those with technology have, are full of drama here at New Beginnings. We just got it like that, Phil. And I feel and also as an OG on the camera. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm continuing in the sermon series that we began to start this year with the almost obvious title of a time of a time for new beginnings. This is part two. We started on last week. This is part two in the series, a time for new beginnings. This will take us up to Lent, the start of Lent. And my particular subtitle for today is decisions for the future. Decisions for the future. It was Dickens that said so long ago in Tale of Two Cities that it is the best of times and the worst of times all at the same time. The best of times and the worst of times all at the same time. A paradoxical statement and paradox is when you hold seemingly two conflicting truths, oxymoron if you will, in tension with each other. Two truths vying each for dominance over the other, but held in tension with one another. And certainly that was played out this past week. I said from this pulpit on last Sunday before our benediction, please, ma'am and sir, be observant. Preoccupy yourself with the unfoldings out of our nation's capital over this next week. History is happening before our very eyes, and we are conscripted into that history. And sure enough, it, the week led up to and exceeded what I even anticipated might unfold on Tuesday, on Sunday of this past week. A new Congress was sworn in, and once again, Nancy Pelosi was um, elected to be the Speaker of the House. And then on Tuesday, we see that the November elections were extended out beyond the close of one year and the beginning of another year in the Georgia Senate runoff elections. And that's what had us conscripting uh, Ray Charles into James Cleveland. And God has smiled on me through the results of the Georgia election. So much like November 5th when we saw a red mirage followed by a blue wave. This time it was in reverse but extended when we saw a blue mirage followed by a red wave but followed up by another blue wave and had us singing Georgia on our mind late night Tuesday and then early in the morning hours. We learned once again he may not come when you want him but we woke up Wednesday morning, and they declared our heart's desire. Well, some said could not happen, but with God, all things are possible. Have I got a witness? 
where both Senate seats were won, Georgia turned blue. And then it occurred to me a second revelation which sent my heart singing with even greater exultation when I realized that on her way to the vice presidency of this United States of America come January 20th is the first woman who happens also to be the first African American to hold the office of the vice presidency, also the first person of Asian descent, and also the first person of uh, far Indian descent as a whole lot of personhood in one dark body, um, but who happens to be a graduate of Howard University. Then at the same time that uh, on their way to the US Senate representing the state of Georgia, the first black person ever the history of this country to be a U.S. Senator from the red clay hills of Georgia who happens also to be the senior pastor currently of the very same Ebenezer Baptist Church pulpit that Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, stood as pastor over and in the same congressional district as the late John Lewis who talked about getting in some good trouble and who happens to be a graduate of Morehouse College and as well, the person who got them both elected and in fact got Biden elected because of her work up in Milwaukee to flip back Wisconsin and her work up in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh to flip back Pennsylvania and her work in Detroit to flip back Michigan and her work in Atlanta to turn Georgia blue happened to be a woman who is a Spelman College graduate, the most powerful woman in America, not Nancy. But Stacy, come on, somebody. Hey, Amen. And is it for those of you who wonder if HBCUs prepare you for life? I rest my case. We were in the heights on Wednesday morning, but we were brought low by midday Wednesday when what was supposed to be what is designed by the layout of our Constitution simply to be a pro forma symbolic act of the joint session of Congress to simply open the envelope and let the President of the Congress, the Vice President, simply read the results of 50 states' elections certified at the state level acknowledged at the federal level, certified at the state level, only acknowledged at the federal level. And then suddenly that became an occasion for strangely enough, ironically enough, shamefully enough, illegally enough, that the current occupant of this White House, manifestly unqualified and ill-prepared and ill-suited and ill-tempered from the very beginning, to call minions from all over the country who came with one objective to somehow or another disrupt the federal acknowledgement of the election that happened on November 5th to try and set aside by some sleight of hand hook or by crook by any means necessary to set aside the majority will of the people manifested through over 160 million ballots, the majority 84 million plus in favor of Joe Biden, that they be set aside and that the current occupant be extended another term simply because that's the outcome that they wanted. It was an attempt in sedition and it turned into a full-blown act of insurrection. And looking through the eyes of an African-American, a people who have come over a way that with tears has been watered and tread a path through the blood of the slaughtered and one of the means by which we have been slaughtered over and over again is in law enforcement and police. And to remember how militarized was the response when Black Lives Matter advocates marched unarmed and peacefully through the streets of our nation's capital this summer, armed only with T-shirts saying, I cannot breathe. And yet they were met by layers and columns of riot police in full military gear and horse-mounted police and the nation at full alert and busloads of 
unarmed, law-abiding, peaceful protesters loaded up into buses taken to be arrested and processed at local police stations and charged. And yet this time, with more than a month's notice and social media posts expressing their full intent to do harm, threatening even death, they came and the layers of security collapsed like a house of cards. The difference was as black and white and it put on full display, ripped the mask off America's pretense of freedom and justice for all and the truth of two separate justice systems, one for white and one for black, as armed, law-breaking, insurrectionists, not protesters, insurrectionists broke through police brigades. Succeeding layers of defense disappeared or were not present at all, broke into the Capitol building, destroying property. Makeshift gallows were erected and a noose hanging and saying, hang Pence, the vice president, for betraying the current president who wanted him to lawlessly try to set aside an election, which he did simply did not have the power to do, saying that they had come for Miss Nancy to harm her, to capture her, kidnap her, to kill her. They called her a witch, spelled with a B. And then they were escorted in and escorted out. And only afterward did it dawn on somebody that maybe somebody ought to be held accountable. My brothers and my sisters, the insult. We, Kevin had called me and asked me if we were going to do Ask the Pastor or conversations with the pastor on Wednesday. And I said, I have too much respect for God, for the vocation to whom I, for which I have been called, and for the people of this church who are associated with me to put myself in front of a live mic as charged as I am with the insult rubbed in my face of the difference between how we are treated by the law and how others are treated by the law. My mother said, if you have nothing good to say, say nothing at all. I said nothing. Thing on Wednesday, I believed in God I might be sane by Sunday morning. And we have seen since a nation in convulsion. The week ended with articles of impeachment being drawn up again, with people calling for Mike Pence to invoke Article 25 and declare this current president incapable of fulfilling his duties even for the remaining 12 days of his term for fear of what he might yet to do in his psychosis and his narcissism. And we find a nation at odds with itself. And my brothers and my sisters, our nation has reached a junction in the road. And that is what brings us to our text for the moment where we see a people at a junction in the road. Moses says to the people that he has led for 40 years, from the slave pits of Egypt to the threshold of downtown Canaan that is in view from the peaks of Mount Nebo, Three times he has asked God to allow him to cross over into the promised land. Three times God has rebuked him and told him no for the sake of Moses' own missteps and past mistakes and has told him to pass the mantle of leadership on to Joshua for whom he will open up the waters of the river Jordan as he opened up the waters of the Red Sea for Moses a generation prior to prove to the people he was as much at work in Joshua as he had been with Moses but told Moses that before he was to disappear into the mist and the fog of the peaks of Mount Nebo, he was to gather the people that he has led for 40 years and tell them that this is a momentous moment. This is a time where the type of people they will become is at risk. And he gathers them together and says to them, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, both are possible, and implores them, choose life. 
and lets them know that the decisions they make in this moment will have far-reaching consequences beyond this moment because the folly of a fool is to believe that the decisions we make only impact us and the moment at hand. That is the sin of the short-sighted. To not be a, to be so close to the forest, we cannot see the trees, and to not back up and not realize that there are moments in life where the decisions we make will have impact for generations to come. And both the blessings and the curse will be passed on to the third and the fourth generation of those who come after them. The book of Deuteronomy, which literally means second law, the Deuteronomy on Touto, the second law, the book that Hezekiah discovered in the temple and made the basis of his temple reforms in the 6th century BC, 7th century BC, it records Moses' final message to the children of Israel. And it is comprised the first 30 chapters. There's three, four other chapters that have some ancillary issues, but the primary issues are addressed in the first 30 chapters, which is a compilation of three sermons that Moses preaches to the children of Israel. The first sermon is simply a recounting of their 40 years in the wilderness. It took Israel one day to get out of Egypt, but it took God to 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And he had to keep them wandering literally around in circles, jumping up and down in the same place, making a lot of tracks, not getting anywhere, because it took that long before Israel, in its collective will, to decide to let God lead them. There was a land sworn unto their fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, but God couldn't let them cross over until they would let him lead them. There are some blessings that God has in store for us, but the timing of our being able to lay claim to those blessings depends at which time God deems we are ready to steward those blessings. And if you're wondering why your own life is going round and round in circles, it may be because God is, has you on a what seems like a wearisome round of repetition because there's still some things God is trying to work out of you before he can bring you into greater glories in his name. And so he recounts the 40-year journey so they never forget where they come from. As the people of God, we are always to live in remembrance of our history and our journeys with God. He or she or they who forget where they have come from also lose grip of where they are supposed to be going. That's why the New Testament church at its founding, Jesus takes the most common elements of bread and wine and assigns them new meaning. For 1,300 years, bread and wine had represented in the mind of the Hebrew a day when the death angel passed over when they were in the land of Egypt. But Jesus said, no longer will we look back 1,300 years to Egypt and the deliverance from the slave pits. Going forward, those who claim the kingdom through the blood of Jesus Christ, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you need to look back toward a hill outside the city where the Lamb of God was lifted high and stretched wide and offered himself as a propitiation for the sins of the world to pay a debt he did not owe because we had a debt we could not pay. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Any saint that forgets the high price that Jesus paid for our pardon is a saint that left God a long time ago. He recounts their journey with God to live in remembrance of all that God has done for us. Then the second sermon is dedicated for them to understand that there are people walking in covenant with God. And what are the promises and the prohibitions of said covenant? And that if they would be faithful to the tenets of that covenant, that God would bless them in the land flowing with milk and honey. If. They would walk in covenant with God and remember the Lord thy God that brought them out of the land of Egypt and out of the household of bondage. Then he would make them the head and not the tail. If they would walk faithfully in the tenets of the covenant and the ordinances of God, then God would bless them and he would open doors for them that no one could shut. Shut doors for them that no one could open. He would bless them that cursed them and he would make sure that they always ended up the head and not the tail. The third sermon is dedicated to the fact 
that sometimes even if they did fall short and violate the tenets of the covenant, that if they would come to God and act of forgiveness and contrition, they could be restored. It is almost an Old Testament root for what Jesus would pull the latent memory of into his instruction on how to pray in Matthew, pray in Matthew 6 when he said, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because, Lord, we pray that we don't get in trouble, but knowing how we are as human beings, when we do stray anyhow, knowing better, Lord, come get us and deliver us from evil. That's why Paul would say to the church, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We serve a God that sends us forth in covenant, and then if and when we violate the covenant, if we will return back to God, with a contrite heart and a broken spirit, then God will restore us to covenant. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then they will hear from heaven. I'll heal their land and forgive their sins. Three sermons. One, to remember what God has done for us. Two, to remind us that we are people walking in covenant and the blessings come with the keeping of covenant. And three, to remember if and when you break the covenant in your foibles and your feet of clay and your humanity, that if you come back to God in contrition with for, uh, f asking for forgiveness, then God will receive you and restore you to said covenant. And the, and, and the apex of that third sermon, calling us back to restoration in those days after our fall, he lets them know that you as a people, as, as I am passing the mantle to Joshua, soon to leave you and disappear up the peaks of the mountain and you cross over into potentially greater glories, you need to understand that the decisions that you make in this moment are going to affect not just you in the short run, but the generations to come. And that every decision you make will have consequences. So make decisions not just for now, but make decisions with the future in mind. It was a moment of decision making. The people that they would become was at hand. There was no inevitability. The future would not ride in on the wheels of inevitability. The future would be determined by the decisions they made then and going future and going into the future. And long after they were moldering in the grave, future generations were going to be impacted for the good or for the bad based upon the decisions that they make. We are now standing in said moment from the White House to the church house. I dare say to those of you in New Beginnings that we understood this when we started this church some 15 years ago as people who were refugees from other ecclesiastical places who huddled all broken with our various experiences of church hurt, acute church hurt. And we huddled in the cafeteria of the Renton High School. And one of the things that were flung from my lips on that very first day is that we would bequeath to future generations 20 to 30 acres of contiguous land so that the people of God and God in the generations to come could build up and tear down whatever they deemed was necessary to exalt the name of Jesus and serve the interests of congregation and community at that time. There are some who've asked the question, why do we need all this land? And my brothers and sisters, I tell you that today, as I told you then, the only thing God ain't making no more of is land. I've been in every church I've been associated with previously, the church I grew up in, the first church I pastored, the church I most recently pastored. The leadership was always guilty of being short-sighted. People who believed when they looked at the land around them, we cannot afford it. That's what their myopic perspective taught them. And the reality was, if they stood back a little bit, they could not afford not to get it. And each one of those churches, in turn, became landlocked. And their fate was dictated by the forces, economic and political forces around them who didn't even know God's name. They became choked out, possibilities strangled because they didn't have the foresight to realize that they need to expand their boundaries, control their borders, dictate their fate so they could be agents that act rather than objects that are acted upon. 
And so here we are again called to resource future generations. I don't know what God and people of God are going to need to do 50 years from now, 100 years from now. I know this. If they don't have the land, they can't even have the conversation. But if they have the land, if they need to build more facilities, more parking, commercial development, housing, whatever they want to do, if they have the land, they can have the conversation. But not only is the legacy we leave them material, but it is first and foremost and most importantly spiritual. I do know. I can put my hands on two to three hundred people who at one time or another have been members of this church who left expressly because of our position on one singular issue. And that is to support the rights to personhood of members of LGBTQ. And to theologically understand that human sexuality is not to be understood as sin or not sin, that gay or straight are both in the will of God. One is not an abomination. Those spurious former interpretations of Scripture have left some feeling exalted over others. We are called by God to love everybody. God is the judge. And preachers who got a cheap amen preaching, God did not make Adam and Steve. God made Adam and Eve. And the reality is God made Adam, Steve, uh, Tyshawn, Shaniqua, and everybody else because all that was made by him was made by him and there's nothing made that is made. And God makes no mistakes. And God did not call me to maximize the church roles or maximize the church offering. And sometimes in the mathematics of God, you got to subtract to add. And one day I've got to stand not before the congregation, but before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged by the deeds done in the body. And as a pastor on my watch, did the marginalized people, were they as welcomed as much into the family of God as those who historically had been included? Was the church a place of inclusion or exclusion? Is the grace of God for all or just some? We, we made a decision a long time ago that we were going to be a church that when our children rise up, they will not be wondering what in the world were they thinking. But they knew that we were thinking about the future generations and gave, bequeathed them a church that was resourced for the future and resourced them a church that had an open door policy for all. That in... The fellowship table of Jesus Christ, there are no high places and there are no low places. And I'm willing, my brothers and sisters, to be talked about, maligned in the short run for the sake of hearing my Savior well, say well done in the long run. The decisions we make, there's life, there's death, there's blessings and there's curse. We choose life. that We and our descendants might live. Our nation now stands at a moment where we can choose life or death, blessings and curse. We've been at this place before. We're in this place in the founding of the nation. Y'all got time for this? You out there in the digisphere, you have at least till next September. There are no games on. None that is of our concern. <laughs> the framers of our constitution, they had a chance in colonial America to decide if we, were, if we were going to mean freedom and justice for all or just for some, Gardner C. Taylor said that when they signed the Declaration of, Institu of Independence and later on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights coiled beneath those tables upon which lay the constitutional documents, coiled beneath the table was the snake of racial discrimination and slavery that would bite us again and again and again. We kicked the can down the road over and over again the Missouri Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Lincoln would come along and say the nation simply can't survive half slave and half free. It led to a colossal contest for the soul of the nation. 600 lay dead on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. And for a moment, they chose life over death. 
to truly mean it, freedom and justice for all, the 13th Amendment ended slavery in all states and territories of these United States of America, the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1868, which guaranteed black folks the same rights that the Bill of Rights had afforded to other people just for breathing, the 15th Amendment, which gave the suffrage to African American men in 1870. For women, it would come 50 years later in 1920, in the 19th Amendment, it was not perfect, but it was some progress. But by 1876, white moderates yielded to the pressure of white racist extremists. And on a last second clandestine deal in 1876, they elected Rutherford, some called him Rutherford B. Hayes, with a deal that he would withdrew federal troops from southern soil so that the Klan and the Knight Riders and the White Citizens Council could use death and tyranny and lynching to burn down the more than 200 towns that black folks had developed of their own hand, sweat and tears after emancipation. Biracial state delegations Black people having the vote had put together and now all of a sudden they cleansed it and they set back the clock. By 1896, separate and very equal was the law of the land and the lights went out to the modern civil rights movement. This nation decided it did not want to become a nation with freedom and justice for all. They were more concerned with uniting southern whites and northern whites under the banner of manifest destiny in the westward movement then they were and be true to its promise and set the nation up for generation after generation of revisiting the same old fight. The hot war of the Civil War gave way to a perpetual cold war, percolating right beneath all of our politics. Nixon would come along with his southern strategy. Reagan would come along and talk about the jungle cities and the welfare queens. George H.W. Bush would talk, uh, he would talk about uh, black folks on furlough, the Willie Horton ads when he was 16 points down with Michael Dukakis because he could always play the race card to make up the difference because he understood the psyche of America. The rhetoric was on the surface, but the bias was beneath. The reality is America has always had two conflicting visions of what kind of nation it was become. Those of you who frequent this place truly believe in freedom and justice for all. Equal protections under the law, equal protections, equal opportunities under the law, equal standing before the law. But there are those who believe in a white predominant nation undergirded by the belief in white supremacy and the converse, the inferiority of all peoples of color. And when you seek to protect privilege, equality is seen as a threat. And what you saw play out in our nation's capital are people enraged by the very same things that we've celebrated. A first black president, a first woman in black headed to the vice presidency, a black senator from the state of Georgia, a black woman with that much power to determine who sits in the White House. What we celebrate, they lament as them losing in America that they truly believe in their hearts is for them. And so now God providentially stands before this so-called indispensable nation and I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. I've set before you true democracy with freedom and justice for all or white privilege led by fascists who use violence and the threat thereof for the privilege for some and the disadvantage of others. We must decide. That is where we are today. America's first and worst sin has been thrown out for the whole world to see. And now we must decide. I've set before you life and death. Our public officials, what a moment that we have. What kind of democracy are we going to hand to our children? Are we going to hand them a democracy? Or are we simply going to hand them a dictatorship, a de facto dictatorship, if not in fact de jure, depending on what laws we set in place. Listen, after what I saw on Wednesday, I am of the opinion as a wounded Seahawks fan that what we need to all do is all fly to New York this week to NFL headquarters. We need to run a phone call in advance to the NFL commissioner and we need to say to him that he needs to find us 11 points so that we, the game can in fact be declared 31 to 30, that we win Los Angeles in advance 
to the second round of the playoffs, that they, we're, we're taking our league back, that they've stolen it from us, that this, this is our individual rights. We have a right to go to the second round despite the fact that they scored more points than us. All they have to do is set it aside and that the commissioner can declare us the winner and we need to go and if necessary tear up the NFL office so that we can be declared the winner of the game anyhow. Is that what we have become? In a democracy, we accept the results whether it's what we wanted in a fair and open election, what determines if it's fair are lawsuits brought before the courts. And if the courts filled with the people you appointed tell you you have no standing with the courts and ask you for evidence of your claims and you have none to present, then the only thing that is left for you to decide, do you believe in democracy or not? What kind of nation are we going to handle our children because anti-democracy anywhere is a threat to the democracy everywhere? We are standing at a junction in the road. I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. We're dealing with the pandemic of COVID-19, but we're also dealing with a pandemic of unprincipled, petty public servants who think only in two year, four year or six year increments, who think not in terms of the health of the democracy that we will leave to future generations. We have come to a point where some are willing to damage the democracy if they think that in doing so it will aid and abet their chances of winning their next election. It was Martin King who said that any any, any, any person that has found nothing in his life worth dying for is not fit to live. And I paraphrase him, any public official that hasn't found an issue worth losing their next election over is not fit to serve in the first place. Any preacher was not found an issue worth losing their pulpit over is not fit to stand and preach in that pulpit in the first place. When we do not live for something larger than ourselves, then what we are living for is not worthy of our life and its energies and its possibilities. Moses stands before the people of God and says, you have a land of promise, promise to you, but it's filled with promise, but you will turn it into chaos. If you do not go in there with the restraints of covenant to be bigger than yourselves and to realize that the decisions you make are consequential, Every decision invariably, inescapably comes with consequences, consequences that will affect future generations. And every generation, the future generations must be kept in mind by every decision, every generation acting in the moment. Martin King said it best. Every generation steps on the stage of history, plays their part and steps off and surrenders the stage to the next generation. It was in the book of Proverbs where Solomon said in the 31st chapter, talking about that virtuous woman, it said that her children will rise up and call her blessed. It is not what you call yourself that matters. It only matters what the future generations, looking back on your life and retrospection of the impact of your life beyond your life, they're going to call you something. What will we be called? Come a little closer to our own private precincts, our own little lives in these little towns where we're making decisions about family, making decisions about finances, making behavioral decisions that impact unborn generations. Are we concerned about simply our own personal desires at the expense of the children we bring in this world and our children's children and those that come thereafter, or do we realize that our life is but a seed that will produce a harvest? That harvest can be bitter or that harvest can be sweet. And we have to choose. We're at a junction in the road. What kind of people are we going to be? There's a story of a man who raised apples his orchard became infested with locusts who ate up the apples and destroyed the orchard. He finally had to lay flame to the orchard and burn it to the ground. 
He was going to retire. He went to the doctor and found out he had a terminal case of cancer. And when he realized that his time was not long, he went home and he told his wife. And then he went out into the fields with a shovel, began digging up the roots of the former orchard. And his wife asked him what he's doing. He said, I'm planting some seeds for a new orchard. She said, honey, it's going to take much longer than the time you have left for anything you plant now to bear fruit. He said, I know it is going to take a long time for this to bear fruit. So I guess I better get started. And I submit to you today, my brothers and sisters, that we have to see our lives as seeds to be planted in such a way that it will bear fruit long after we're moldering in the grave. Is not that what our Jesus did when he offered himself up as a propitiation for the seeds of the wor- sins of the world and as a seed buried, raised again by the power of his father? And now two millenniums later, his sacrifice on that cross continues to bear fruit as we still find our way into the old ship of Zion because he made a decision not to come down from the cross to save himself, but he decided to die so that whosoever will believeth in him will not have to perish but have everlasting life. To as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's where we're conscripted in. We weren't there on that day at the foot of that old rugged cross. But we have since heard the old good news of the old, old story of Jesus and his love, and we have believed on his name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. But we have something to confess because he would not come down from the cross. His father had set before him life and death, blessing and curse. He chose life that we might live. What do we choose today? What do we choose? As churches, what kind of church are we going to be bequeathed to our next generations? Bigoted institutions where we think our, we try to convince ourselves and others that our hatred is ordained by God? Or make them a place where the broken, the wounded can come and find in him a resting What kind of nation are we going to offer? Are we going to be a citadel of democracy for the world to model? An angry aggregation of tribes who believe in dominance and power by any means necessary. What kind of people are we going to be? Opportunist or simply unprincipled? Petty public servants trying to get theirs at the expense of so many. God has said before us, life and death, blessings and curse, you choose. We all must choose that you might live and our descendants might live. Get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of more. Get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of more. Get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of more. Oh, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of more. Listen, this train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Don't ride nothing but the good and the holy. This train is bound for glory. This train, say it again. This train is bound for glory. This train, mm-hmm. this train is bound for glory. This train, 
This train is bound for glory. Don't ride nothing but the good and the holy. This train is bound for glory. This train, but this train, don't ride McConnell. This train. This train, don't ride McConnell, this train. This train, don't ride McConnell, you enabled and we hold you responsible. This train, don't ride McConnell, this train. Mm, this train, don't ride no Lindsay, this train. This train, don't ride no Lindsay, this train. This train don't ride no Lindsay. You stood with him. Your excuses are flimsy. This train don't ride no Lindsay. This train. This train don't ride no Ted Cruz. This train. This train don't ride no Ted Cruz. This train. This train don't ride no Ted Cruz. You endorsed him, but he made you look a fool. This train don't ride no Ted Cruz. This train. And this train don't ride Josh Hawley. This train. This train don't ride Josh Hawley. This train. Oh, this train don't ride Josh Hawley. You planned insurrection and you're full of folly. This train don't ride Josh Hawley. This train, oh no. And this train don't ride Mike Pence. This train. This train don't ride Mike Pence. This train. Oh, this train don't ride Mike Pence. You stayed silent, you sat on the fence. Now this train don't ride Mike Pence. This train, and this train don't ride no QAnon. This train, this train don't ride no QAnon. This train, oh, this train don't ride no QAnon. You better catch a clue or just go on this train. Don't ride no QAnon on this train. And this train don't ride no Trump. This train. This train don't ride no Trump. This train. No, this train don't ride no Trump. 84 million gave Trump the dump. This train don't ride no Trump. This train, oh, this train is bound for glory. This train, oh, this train is bound for glory. This train, this train is bound for glory. Don't ride nothing but the good and the holy. This train is bound for glory. This train, so get on board, little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of more. Get on board. Little children, 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 get on board. Little children there's room for listen. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I've got, everything I am, everything I'm not. I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. Oh, I'm yours, Lord. Yes, I am. Everything I got. Yes, I am. Everything I am. Oh, yes, I am. Everything I'm I am. I am yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can. Say it again, I'm yours. I'm yours, Lord. Everything. Everything I've got. Everything. Everything I have. Absolutely everything. Everything I'm not. I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. Ah, get on board. Little children, get on. Whosoever will, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I offer you Jesus. 
I offer you Jesus, the same Jesus who said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up brokenhearted, to open deaf ears and open blind eyes, to set the captives free, and to proclaim now is the acceptable year of the Lord. If you want that Jesus who offers you, so, who offers you personal salvation and the pursuit of a more just world in which to live, I offer you Jesus, whosoever will. is still the only name under heaven by which you shall be saved, whosoever will. If you need a church home, there's a button on your computer screen that says, how can I become a member? Just hit it. It will tell you. Take you out, bring you right back to the service. Now is the time. God is standing before you with offering you life and death, blessing and curse. You choose. You choose. Oh, get on board. Get on board. Get on board. Little children, there's a room for me. Oh, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of Oh, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for plenty of One more time on board. Little children, get on board. Little children, get on board. Little children.